Let's say a very good morning to Alan Tolhurst. Alan, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Nice to see you. Have a look at this, because uh, I've been playing this all morning. Uh, this is Keir Starmer on the eve of the election in July, um, July the 4th, where he was basically talking about how ready he was to take over as Prime Minister. Now, it might... Oh, we haven't got it. I'll come back to that. Um, you might remember, he basically says, you know, and we're ready to govern. We've basically got every single department ready to go. Uh, it'll be a government of service. It will not be a, a government of self-entitlement. I know the, the quote so well. Uh, oh, here we are. We've got it. Here we go. We've prepared this party for government. We have prepared all of our departments for government. If we are privileged to come in to serve our country, it will be public service for me, as it always has been, not self-entitlement. Yes. Well, I mean, I don't know what you want to say about that, Alan, but um, it hasn't really worked out quite like that, has it? <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the hubris of opposition, I would say. There's, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of the problems, obviously, that, that the government has faced in the last few months have come from the fact that, you know, in opposition, they jumped on anything that the government did that even had the whiff of kind of scandal. And that's that's what you should do in opposition. Yeah. But you have to understand that it will come back and bite you if you're not whiter than white when you take over the reins of power. And a lot of things that they did in opposition that were not under the scrutiny, the same scrutiny that you get when you're in government, they're now facing that scrutiny. And it's uh, that, that the kind of the harsh glare of, uh, of being in government is obviously expose several things that are making them look a little bit foolish and i think that there's gonna be quite a lot of those quotes in the same way that you know when when uh, rishi sunak first stepped into downing street he talked about kind of um you know the how good the government was going to be in transparency and accountability mm. and that always got thrown back in his face whenever there was any kind of scandal yes. i think a lot of things are going to happen similarly with keir starmer all the things that they said in the a lot of things they said especially about the boris johnson administration and Liz Truss administration are going to be used against them in the in the coming months if they don't get a grip on mm. some of the stuff that they're, they're, they're having trouble with but of course the difficulty for me with this is that it's not just about you know saying that you're going to do things that which you can't then do but if you're going to say that we have got a, a, a prepared plan and you know all of our departments are ready to go you know he's not just saying we aim to be the best government that we've had in 15 years he's actually saying we've got it down we're ready you know we've been practicing for this for six months maybe a year mm -hmm. uh, we've got sue gray the world's most brilliant brain she's going to fix everything and set us up for the first hundred days uh, and also by the way knowing what he knew about what he was taking from lord ali and saying that it won't be a government of self-entitlement I and mean, he was literally making a trap for himself wasn't he uh, yeah, and, and I think given the fact that, you know, in the first 100 days, what, you know, can you point out, the, the government points to lots of things they've they've announced they're going to do, but actually in terms of things like the, the big things on the economy and things they were going to do in terms of, um, you know, changing the way that the government spends money and tax and all that kind of, the, the big important stuff to be able to get themselves economically on the right page mm. to move forward, that really hasn't happened. The only big economic measure so far has been the cutting of winter fuel right. allowance, which obviously has gone down very poorly. And, you know, the, they, they keep saying that the OBR needs 10 weeks for them to to, to come up with the figures before a budget, right? But it's going to be 16 weeks yeah. between the election and the budget. That's not, that's a minimum of six weeks kind of dead air mm. that they're, they're going to have. And there's going to continue to be the wranglings over where the, where the cuts are going to fall. They've, you know, they've, they've kind of rolled the pitch almost too well in terms of telling us how difficult the decisions are going to be. But they've left open this kind of vacuum into what those potential decisions are going to be, whether it's going to be cuts to aid funding, to whether it's going to be an increase on, on inheritance tax. There's going to be a huge amount of stuff that we, we still don't know and we're still not going to know until until the end of the month when Rachel Reeves steps mm. up and, and, and gives us her first budget. And the word is that there's an awful lot of rewriting of that said budget going on as we speak because they've worked out that a lot of the things that they wanted to do, like the non-DOMS uh, uh, scenario, like the uh, private school VAT, like the raid on, on pensions for taxes, likely not to maybe now be in there because they've worked out that either one, it's a much more difficult thing to make work and two, it might not actually account for that much more money. Yeah, and, and again, going back to what I said about the, the OBR, is that actually you have to submit these things well in advance. So if they're rewriting them, then they might not have had a chance, the OBR might not have had a chance to properly assess them, mm. in which case they'll fall foul of exactly the same thing that they accused previous governments of, of falling foul of. But you're right, things like the non-DOM, I think the government have a bit of a shifting stance on this because originally they said that it would they would make money, but obviously we know that people who are non-DOMs tend to be like pretty mobile in terms yeah. of their capital, be able to move away. So they're saying, well, actually, it doesn't matter because it's a moral decision that we want to make sure that people are domiciled here 
properly for tax reasons, which is a perfectly understandable, you know, concept. But you can't then say that we're going to use a billion pounds of it to fund things like school breakfast clubs, which right. I said they're going to, if it therefore isn't going to make that money. So, yeah, you're right. There's probably some some pretty tricky conversations going on in the Treasury at the moment as to work out, you know, politically how they can make some of this stuff work. But economically, you know, they've got this 22 billion pound black hole. Mm. If Rachel Reeves in her budget deliver something that doesn't add up to filling that £22 billion black hole, then that's obviously going to be very difficult for her. Oh, of course. And I'm talking to journalists who, who have sort of daily dealings with Downing Street. They've been telling me that it's been so badly organised that they don't know really from one day to the next what's going on. People talk about the grid, which I know is a yeah. bit of an inside the, you know, the beltway type conversation. But, you know, this was something that supposedly we learned from this new book that Sue Gray was supposed to be masterminding. Lord Ali uh, was in on it as well. And they were supposed to be planning, you know, um, all sorts of announcements, all sorts of press conferences, you know. And it started off maybe um, slightly un unlikely for them because, because of the riots and everything else. But yeah. at the end of the day, um, the journalists tell me they've literally had no plans really at all. And whole days would sometimes go by without yeah. anyone issuing any kind of statement of any kind about anything. And you kind of go, yeah. well, what's going on? Yeah, completely. And, and look, some people will dismiss, you know, the importance of the grid as simply sort of like, you know, it's too much focus on media management and not the delivery of government. Yeah. But it's very hard to deliver on what you want to do if you're fighting massive fires the whole time, yeah. which which a lot of that can be solved by having much better media management. For example, you know, at party conference, you know, normally at party conference, the, the, the party that is there will have a story into each day, a big mm. story into each day that will dominate the, the, the broadcast around and dominate all the front pages because the other party doesn't do anything during that week right. so you've got you know, the field is vacated we didn't get that at labor they didn't have a big story into each day which allowed us to continue to, to write about things like the donations mm. and and the sue gray and all that kind of stuff you know similarly the week but the weekend before you know Keir Starmer didn't do the big interviews on the sunday before conference there wasn't a big policy announcement into right. the saturday or sunday papers which again allowed the stories around you know the the, the lord alley stuff everything to kind of mm. to dominate and the way they they handled that you know, they let it run on and on and on for so sort of two, three weeks. And then once it died down, they then reignited it again by Starmer announcing he was going to hand some of the money back and, right. and dredged it all back up again. And, you know, I, I imagine people were sort of tearing their hair out. And I think what's quite key is, is that you've seen Morgan McSweeney take over as chief of staff. And one of the first things he did was not just appoint some deputies and move some people around. Right. He brought in James Lyons, who's a former Sunday Times journalist, to basically manage the grid. And, you know, again, some people dismiss that as being, oh, it's just trying to keep people like me happy by, you know, giving us stories each day. But it's an important part of the job to be able to, to, to control the narrative. You know, in opposition, it's really hard to make the weather mm. politically. You know, you're very reactive. I think Labour have, have really acted almost like they're still in opposition. Yeah. They're the ones who can make the weather would they, should they choose to. And, you know, they're going to have to try to wrestle that control. Otherwise, things are going to kind of spin out. Right. Them. And a lot of people um, tell me that I don't know him. I don't know Morgan McSweeney. I don't know Sue Gray. Uh, I know people who know both of them um, who say that he's not necessarily going to be the answer. He's a kind of turbocharged version of Dominic Cummings and Alice Campbell rolled into one. Bit of an ideologue, um, you know, says he wants to have a reshuffle sometime after the budget. Uh, Starmer says that's not happening. Says he wants to make radical changes to what's uh, mm. gov way government is run um, in The Guardian. I'm not sure the public will want him to do anything like that. No, I think it was put to me basically that they think that, that Sue Gray wasn't political enough for that role, but maybe that Morgan McSweeney is too political yeah. for that role, and actually there's needs to, uh, you know a combination of the two of them, with him doing more political side and her doing the more kind of machinery of government administrative side, was that there the, you know was the ideal they wanted. But obviously they couldn't make it work between the two of them. I guess you know people were saying that uh, you know they were more having two voices. In the, in number ten was too, was too much and people weren't able to kind of focus on what they were doing because they had kind of two masters in terms of what they were doing. Mm. But you know, it'd be interesting to see whether McSweeney can take on more of that kind of machinery role. We know that obviously you know people come in and want to rip up how things are done. As you say, the uh, comparison with Dominic Cummings, the way he wanted to change how seventy Whitehall and, and Downing Street was run. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it's a big amount of work and actually there's an awful lot of things in their intro to be able to getting on with. And and can you focus enough bandwidth on making those changes when you've got so much happening? day to day yeah exactly right and i mean they're not making friends really anywhere lindsay, even lindsay hoyle was upset with them yesterday uh, in parliament he had a go at them over the chagos islands uh, scenario have a look ministers should come to the house to announce their policies in the first instance if that means waiting a few days and the excuse that we may have an election elsewhere in the world is not my concern because it is the election it is the elected members in this house on both sides that I represent. 
So I think old uh, David Lammy and Keir Starmer have got a bit of work to do behind the scenes there, haven't they? Yeah, and again, come back to what they said in opposition. They were so critical of the Conservative government mm. for making announcements outside the chamber, for not giving due respect to Parliament, you know, because you're meant to make announcements yes. on the floor of the House on the dispatch box and then go and give interviews in the media about it. And that's obviously not the way that it happened. Obviously, they claim that they, they had to do it for various sort of political mm. and diplomatic reasons. But again, they like say you're not, you're not really making friends. You know, it's one of the big, big announcements they make, obviously, just returning from, from Parliament after recess, and they weren't able to make it in the chamber. So, yeah, you know, if you're looking to kind of win people around to your side, if you're if you're looking to maybe make make control of the kind of the you know not have things made difficult for you in the way you want to get things through the Commons, yeah, you want to get Lindsay Hall on your side, and if you you don't want to see him when he's when he's not on your side. No, exactly right. That's just a bad bad place to be. Anna, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Anna Tolhurst, their chief reporter and podcast host, Politics Home.